Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. This is episode 2021.2 and I'm Rohan Karamandi and as usual we have Phil with us. Hey Phil. Hey Ryan, how's it going? Good, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Get to finally do this in the evening, which is which is really weird for me to be doing it at this time <laughs> after work. So, yeah, it's odd. <laughs> I know you get to be awake today. That's right. You get to be the sleepy one. Exactly. Exactly. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that supports the Home Assistant project. Configuration is done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with any router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. This episode is sponsored by morebeard.com. For over 25 years, they've helped creative people like you create your own beer, wine, or coffee at home. Find out more at morebeard.com. Listeners of this show save $10 off their first order with promo code HASPODCAST. That's H-A-S-S podcast. So to start with... um... If you haven't already noticed, there were two security bulletins put out by Home Assistant. Uh, essentially, what's happened is on January 14th, Home Assistant released 2021.1.3 to address a security issue. Uh, and then they released a second one, 2021.1.5, to, really, uh, to address an additional security issue. So essentially what happened is um, they found that anything, any third party plugins had access to a couple of different uh, areas under the covers, uh, basically where it could access any file that's accessible by Home Assistant uh, itself. So this these two patches have basically been brought in to address that security issue. Um, and and this is if you use the Home Assistant Community Store or hacks, or if you have anything that you just downloaded off of GitHub, you definitely should upgrade immediately. And just proactively, what they've done as well, if you do subscribe to Nabucasa, they are blocking remote access uh, just for your security uh, to any instances that are older than 2021.1.5. So. That is, from what I understand, and Phil, I don't know if you have a different uh, idea on this, but from what I understand, you can actually go into your Home Assistant release and, uh, sorry, into your Home Assistant uh, configuration and actually re-allow that to join Nabucasa in the interim if you haven't updated yet. But um, by default, it is blocked. Yeah, so I think the idea being here that they... This is, they obviously knew that people were out there running these compromised systems and, you know, with Nebuchadnezzar just allowing remote access to those instances, it was just easy for them to uh, go ahead and block everyone that was running an older version. I think the issue then became was that, you know, not everyone is running, you know, custom components and, you know, the Home Assistant community store, so they're not vulnerable. You know, Home Assistant has, you know, has made it very clear that you are only vulnerable if you're running the you know, custom components yeah. with, or you're running the Home Assistant Community Store with those affected components. If you're not affected, then it was really like, oh, now I have to upgrade for something that I'm not vulnerable for. So, yeah. yes, if there is, it's an, you have to opt back in. So you have to go, I think you have to log into your Nebuchadnezzar control panel and, you know, just, you know, I I think there's a, like a, an acceptance, you know, I accept that, you know, my Home Assistant instance isn't running any community add-ons. I'm not vulnerable to the security bulletin and then you can restore your access. Right, right. And I think at first there were a lot of uh, concerns about, you know, hey, what what is this issue, uh, so on, and and kind of what what the home assistant group did is they basically said, okay, you know what, let's just let's just get get a patch out first, then then we can talk about the specifics afterwards. Mm. Um, I think I think that rubbed a few people the wrong way, but I mean at the, at the end of the day. Um, the, the core dev team did actually do what's right. They did fix everything and s- followed by saying, hey, by the way, you know, this is what's happening. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's a directory traversal attack essentially is is what's capable, right? And uh, that includes, you know, your secrets.yaml and, and things like that. That's why the uh, that's why they decided to make it such a loud vocal you know, security patch to say, hey, like it, it needed to be in your face because at the end of the day, I, I get it from their perspective. They don't want to be exposing your uh, credentials when, mm-hmm. when you know, Home Assistant is supposed to be a very focused 
privacy focused, security focused kind of deployment, right? Where you control a lot of that. And to some extent that goes with, you know, by you doing a DIY thing, the onus is on you. It is an open source tool. It is, there's no, you know, body that that's responsible specifically per se, but at the same time, uh, they also wanted to do their due diligence to make sure that everything is taken care of, which, you know, from my from my side, I, I respect that. It's a bit like you, you've got like a, uh, could you imagine like a government saying, you know, to, oh, hey, we've got our military, but um, just don't attack us from this side because we have no defense on that side, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So, you know, I think, I think that's, that's, um, that, that's a big, big part of why they did what they did. Yeah. And there's also a lot of moving parts. For example, they had to contact, you know, authors of custom components. They couldn't reach out to all of them, you know. People, a lot of these custom components, you know, just people doing it in their spare time. They're not getting paid yeah. for this. So, you know, like uh, there was, you know, they had to reach out to whoever, say, hey, you know, you need to put this fix in. You've got a vulnerability here. But, you know, they couldn't do it publicly because then, you know, everyone would know where the vulnerability was. And if everyone knows, then the bad guys know. Uh, but I think the components that uh, were identified include the Dwayne's Laplace dashboard, Font Awesome, um and a few others as well so if you are running you know any custom component i would advise you to go in do the upgrade immediately if you haven't already or uh make sure that you've blocked home assistant from remote access because even if you are a nebu casa subscriber it doesn't mean that if you've punched a hole through your wi-fi settings yeah. that people can't get in anyway exactly if you if you have a second way in or out of your system then you know you might want to make sure that that's that's dealt with as well and uh you know and and even even in general i mean i am a huge fan of patching any security mm. patches especially right um and 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 i understand that there's a lot of people out there that haven't you know you might be running some ancient version 0.0 you know, 30 or yeah. five or something like that. Right. Which, I mean, there, there's, there's, you know, other things to be said, but I, I get it. Right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's that, that aspect of it too. But I mean, in this case, um, this is something that, you know, I would strongly say uh, from my side as well, I would actually encourage upgrading. And again, will you break a thing or two possibly if you haven't upgraded in a long time? Um, but for the most part, uh, it should be, uh, it should be okay. Mm. And I think breaking change is getting more like much easier to handle now anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and even with things like safe mode and things like that, if especially if you're if you're on coming from an older version, uh, you know, it makes a it makes a difference. But yeah, just huge bulletin from from the home assistant group there is just upgrade, please. <laughs> Done. Yeah. All right, so Rahan, we had uh, a bit of feedback come in from our last episode. Yeah, I think it was one of our busiest email weeks last <laughs> I week. Know, right? I think we've still got a few unread that we have to get through. We do, yeah. Um, but garbage collection. So this here, here is a funny story. This this will be my, uh, I knew I shouldn't have said it. So last <laughs> week I, I sort of made the comment like, oh, you know, why why have these bloody garbage collection things, right? Like just, mm-hmm. I use a template sensor. It's fine. It's worked for me for donkey's years. Would you believe that? So I have a template sensor. All it does is it works out if the weak number is odd or even, yeah. and if it's an odd number, then it tells me that the garbage collection is one week, and then the, for the odd number, it tells me, right, put the other bin out. For whatever reason, uh, since we ticked over to the new year, the weak numbers have now switched from odd <laughs> even. So now my template sensor, which I was very happily about, you know, very smug about in the last episode, I now have to go in and, and switch everything back. I have to reverse everything, basically. See, to, this is this is why. Yeah. This, this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have said it. I was too smug. Um, but so Billy from episode 70 uh, emailed us in and just reminded us that, you know, he uses a garbage collection custom component uh, from Bruxy 70. So, yep. you know, there's definitely options. I know um, lots of complicated ones and even uh, Irwin has taken it a step further. So... Erwin has different schedules for waste, paper, compost, and plastic there in the Netherlands. So, yeah. uh, which kind of, I, I couldn't, now that's when you would need like a, an API and a custom component for this, right? So, Erwin's actually designed a little 3D model of a, a miniature wheelie bin that can sit on a, a table somewhere. <laughs> and we'll put photos up on this on, on the show notes on housepodcast.io because it's fantastic. So, it's this little mini wheelie bin and it has a translucent bin. 
and has a translucent lid. And yeah. in that lid are some LED lights. And so from there, he can change the color of the LED lights to denote which bin needs to go out that week. So that's really cool and pretty cute, actually. Could you imagine that, like, sitting in your kitchen counter, just on the windowsill somewhere, and you go, all right, it's Monday, I need to take the bins out. Oh, which bin? Oh, yeah. green lid. Okay, put the green lid bin out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that that kind of helps too, right? And mm. it's, 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 you know, and I kind of talked about it last week too, especially if you have a complex. I mean, we, we at least don't have different ones on different days they're all consistent on on the day depending on where you are for me it's i think it's wednesday i should know this it's uh, <laughs> i think it's wednesday and but you know on odd weeks i will have garbage mm-hmm. right and 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 on the i guess that's called the even weeks i won't have garbage sometimes in the summer there's leaf collect or in the fall there's like leaf collection in the summer there's leaf collection and then they randomly stop in the middle of the <laughs> middle of the year for yeah. for winter because you're not sweeping up leaves or anything from the from the ground or you're not you know throwing away any plants or anything and and then there's like just all kinds of like two days a year they do like battery collection and like it, it so it's for stuff like that again it is it can get kind of complex right so I, I I totally totally see why and get why um, I did I did really like the little model uh, Irwin had though those are pretty pretty cool yeah very cool um and so then last week i also mentioned about rumorware lighting commands uh and i think you know um you know for example being able to walk into a room and say turn on netflix to the amazon echo and it knows you know all right you're in the bedroom so turn on the tv here mm-hmm. or you know, turn on the lights and the echo does that pretty well um as usual but keith emailed in and he's actually set up uh, something very similar so he can control music tv lighting all powered in Node Red, so I'm not a Node Red fan myself, but I'm def- I'm pretty sure I could replicate something in YAML. Yeah. So I think that's a path that I'll sometime this year I'll try and get towards. It's 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 funny you mentioned you're not a Node Red fan, but uh, it's I you know several people at uh, at work we have a we have a WebEx Teams room that basically is just around uh, home automation users in mm-hmm. in Montreal, and and for whatever reason I'm added to it too, even though I'm Toronto, but and. Uh, <laughs> And and some of these guys love Node Red, right? And to the point yeah. where one guy is actually putting on a second tutorials because he did the first one in French, and I I don't speak French well, <laughs> uh, or or at all really. And uh, and uh, so he was uh, he's like, you know what? I'm going to do another tutorial, and I'm going to convince you guys. So uh, I'm I'm waiting on him to set that up for me. And uh, you know, it's just kind of one of those like small group discussions where he's going to go through and and yeah look at it right and uh you know i'm 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 interested right it's it's uh convinced me otherwise right and uh i i do think you know i i, I have seen some pe- people do some pretty cool automations with node red and great i'm you know open mind right so exactly yeah for me it's just i don't know maybe it's just my my programmer's brain i just can't get my head around having because i have a multitude of possible conditions right like i've got an automation mm-hmm. that has like condition branches you know like two sets of different conditions could be true and you know just thinking about trying to set that up or replicate that in node red yeah just i, I th- it would take me longer to tr- click and drag things around that would be just type it out right yeah and uh, i mean I, I i do once uh <laughs> Fr- frank does this a lot where where he basically tells me that i'm not doing something right and then fixes it <laughs> like, and, like makes, <laughs> makes me fix it and uh so he he actually got me into the uh home assistant uh plugin for for uh, vs code for visual studio code yeah and uh and uh, again changed my life right like it's it's one of those automations you know it, it fills in like let's call it 50 percent of what i need to do yeah because it's got like the entity id like auto completion that's amazing yeah it's got all that it talks to it talks to your home assistant instance and it says yep. hey you know what go you know sensor dot oh it's your or sort of binary sensor dot oh motion living room okay great yep. so it'll fill that stuff in for me rather than me having to flip back and forth between my home assistant instance my the documentation and and uh code itself so it's yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's just, you know, it's that's something I don't think I can do with Node Red and, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh but yeah, it's that would be that would be I'm still interested in seeing what's out there and again maybe run that on the side, run a couple of automations through there and see what happens. That's it, right? So many ways to skin the cat. Yeah, yeah. And then Fuzzy Mistborn reached out to us about uh, dark sky replacements. So 
Uh, they've got a few on their blog. We'll leave links in the show notes. A bit US focused, but good to see that you know other people are also thinking about you know moving on from Dark Sky. So yeah, exactly. Um, and and the, the the title of the article sounds really really like morbid, but really cool. Weather in a post Dark Sky world, which uh, sounds sounds like a movie. I like it. I like it. <laughs> It's funny. Um, all right. So 2021.2, it is here. What's new in that release? So this is what the first release of uh, the year that, you know, they've had like a full January right to work on, you know, the first release of the year was sort of like over the break in December and mm-hmm. after the conference. So this is like yeah, probably the one of the, the first big release of the year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the big, <laughs> one of the big releases in that, and there, there's a whole, religion topic here is uh z wave js or z wave js uh which is a new integration coming in with home assistant now there's been a ton of i know especially with z wave there's been a ton of back and forth and on on the Mm. forums on various you know whether it's reddit or this and that around you know what's the direction where are we going so on so forth right I I I think you know that might have to be an episode on its own and see what's happening there, but not not that I not that I have any idea what what the actual official take on it is. So I'm just throwing <laughs> that one out there. But uh, you know, as as part of this new release, uh, Z Wave JS is coming in. Uh, there's an integration with Home Assistant. Uh, you'll need to be running a Z Wave JS server where there is an official add on from from the Home Assistant supervisor. Uh, or, or from the yeah from from the add-on store in the home assistant supervisor yeah i mean if if you know i know i know a lot of people have been having issues with z-wave or the way it's implemented whatever might be a good good uh way to give it a shot um yeah please please don't send the pitchforks after me i'm i'm literally just saying what's new in the features <laughs> it's interesting so like this just came out of the blue like i i've i've always been like frustrated with z-wave Mm-hmm. Just because it is proprietary, right? Like they've locked it down. And I think maybe this is a sign. I think they recently started opening things up, making more, things more open source. And I think this is sort of the Z-Wave JS project might be uh, some of the causes of that happening. Yeah. So now that they started to open up, now we're getting more projects. Because late last year, they Home Assistant started integrating with um, under the hood Z-Wave to MQTT. Yes. Which was like a similar to Zigbee to MQTT, where uh, you know this separate system would send devices and Z-Wave states over MQTT discovery to Home Assistant. I don't know what's happened to that. I don't know if this project has become Z-Wave JS or, or whatever, but I assumed and, and for it did look like that that was sort of the route Home Assistant was taking in sort of you know who is going what, what system or what you know what are we going to use to control z-wave for home assistant users so uh, z-wave js looks like that's where they've landed on um if you don't run home assistant uh supervised there are docker containers that you can get to run it yourself for me personally i'm gonna probably stay with the vera just until you know yeah. it's isolated I, and plus i don't have to repair everything yeah yeah and that's that's a big issue right repairing and it is good to see that you know this is a because z-wave is a very popular protocol yes yeah. the devices are can be expensive but hopefully that will get better in time uh and yeah it's good to see that you know home assistant are taking this seriously and you know moving away from open z wave that sort of is very hard to integrate with home assistant and now just you know outsourcing that to a z wave js that can manage that and integrate well tightly with home assistant yeah and and i mean to me this also kind of says that you know and 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 again this is somebody that doesn't use z wave at home or, or anything like that now right but to me, that says, you know, there might be a little bit of modularity here that you can you can actually leverage mm-hmm. where, you know, let's say Z-Wave JS or Z-Wave JS is your chosen flavor that you like to use for, for your Z-Wave stuff. Cool. Right. Same with Z-Wave to MQTT, whatever, whatever it is. Right. And and again, I don't know that that's necessarily where they're going with it, but there may be an option in the back end to you might have to come in as custom components or something like that, where where you actually choose what kind of engine you use, right? And and again, I don't know the feasibility of that, or I don't even know if that's 
going to be a remotely supported direction or, or what kind of underpinnings there might be. But, you know, if if that's the case, then then cool, right? More power to you. But the only only thing there I would say is at that point, you, you, know, you now started, yeah, you now need to start doing more research in terms of what may or may not work for you, right? And mm. I know that was the thing I had, like when I was, so I started off with a, just a USB Z-Wave stick. Yeah. And depending on the controller software that you had would, you know, greatly vary what capabilities you had with some less common z-wave devices for example you know like um you might not be able to set a configuration properly or it may just you know send the wrong command and then yeah or me being in australia i would have to uh, find the u.s version of the device i have and then tell you know pull requests into the open z-wave project so that it would map the Australian variant to the US variant, so it knew what the device I was pairing was. If that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you know, with these different projects, it will allow you to sort of, you know, find something that you're comfortable with and is compatible with your home as well. Yeah, or just use Zigbee like I do. That'll work yeah. too. You know, like I, I really love Zigbee, but I it's don't know. The- I, I, st- I yeah. still find like a random light in my house will, for whatever reason, yeah, won't turn off. <laughs> Or like so, I have like a bathroom, really, and I have two two down lights. I have a bathroom. Yeah, believe it or not, Ron, I have a bathroom. I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't surprised at that part. I mean, I, I'm I'm really happy for you, Phil. But <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but so I've got a bathroom. And it's got two down lights, and so each down light is a separate down light. Uh, yeah. And I have, and they're in a group, right? And so mm-hmm. I have a switch. You know, turn the group off, and it turns both down lights off. But for whatever reason randomly one of the downlights just won't receive the signal from the group to turn off. And so, you know, you're clicking the switch and then both lights, you know, turn on, one light turns off, one light turns on, one light. Mm. And so you have to click the on and off button several times before both downlights will turn off. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, you know, I've got down all my downlights are Z-Wave repeaters. So, sorry, yeah. Zigbee repeaters. So there's no issue with range. It's just whatever reason they just drop off for that few seconds and it's yeah it, it, that's it frustrates odd. me yeah i i've i can't say because i've i've got i mean in terms of lights i've only i've only got two uh mm. which are tad free lights from ikea um but I've, I've never i mean i've seen a bit of issue where one of them might be half a second behind even though they're in a group yeah, yeah. Uh, or like like not even half a second like it's just noticeable where one turns off yep maybe like just before the other but they they've actually been rock solid for me. Maybe I'm just lucky. I don't know, but they've been pretty uh, pretty rock solid. Maybe maybe that's something you got to take a uh, uh, just some kind of an analyzer or something and have a look and see what your yeah I've n- tried noise floor is like or whatever. Yeah, right? the, the decons, Wi-Fi level, like the the decons channel, and I've done all that. Like it's pretty like for the most part, most days there won't won't be an issue. But it's just you know randomly, mm-hmm. you know one of those I'll get like a, a light in the corner. Or a light in the middle of the house, whatever reason, just won't turn on. Interesting. So, yeah, I I use ZHA. Not that that should really make that much of a difference, but may, maybe it does. I don't know. But no, uh, um, Decon ZHA. This is, it's all the, the one stick, right? So yeah, you, you'd hope that that's that's the case. Yeah, it's yeah. I use my Con B with that. And, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. Um, another feature coming in the, this release is the input number entity ID can now be used for numeric state trigger thresholds. So this will allow you to do some more uh, powerful automations. So uh, if you've got, for example, you don't want the thermostat in your home to turn on until uh, a certain temperature is reached, you can have that temperature set as an input number and then you can make it variable in the UI. So you can go in and adjust it. So on one day it could be, you know, 27 and the next day it could be 32. And you don't have to reload automations. You don't have to use templates to find out what that value is. It's now supported. Uh, and just as the from a state train, you know, it goes above whatever this value is. Yeah. Automation gets triggered. That's cool. Yeah. Actually, it's 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 interesting. Have you have you again tangent? Sorry, uh, have you have you played with variables yet in Home Assistant? Uh, in ter- so in terms of like scripts and, and all that, like mm-hmm. not well. I mean, I I so I was showing you before we we started recording. I've got the um those tag readers. Yeah. Uh, from yeah, and the example automations on Home Assistant come with variables um in them. So yeah. 
but I haven't used them anywhere else. Like I've just copied and pasted the example automations. I can see how they work, but I I haven't used the variables. Yeah. Really. I think, I think I want to, and I I don't know. Well, yeah. Like, 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 I I don't know if they'll, they'll work the same way. It's, that's something I need to look at the Mm. documentation for, but uh, yeah, it's, so so where where can you use it and where can't you use it? I know scripts are possible. Yep. Um I think because automation uses the same logic as scripts, yeah. can you, you can use it in automation yes. too, yep. right? Yeah. Um, um so the way I understand it and you know, it basically you define your your variables before the action takes part. Mm-hmm. And you can also define the variables um in the trigger as well of an automation. Right. Um, and so in the in the case of the tags automation, so you would set up your variables for the tag IDs and what those tag IDs then relate to. So, for example, I've got a home assistant tag, uh, you know, and it has an ID. I can then say, right, for this ID, the media content type is music and the Spotify playlist is this URL. Right. And so then when it comes down to getting into the automation, because the it will then uh, map basically in an, an array, you know, this uh, tag ID and this media content type, and then, then you can form it as part of the data to the service that you're calling, for this case, media.playmedia. Right. So you can use it for that to like to do that sort of variables. Otherwise, I'm guessing you can use templates in those variables as well. It, it just makes things a little bit cleaner when it comes down to the action part. But yeah. most of what you can do with templates now you can do you you should be able to achieve with variables anyway yeah because i know some some things when i was trying to just play around and and again this is also sometimes at like two in the morning when i'm doing this Mm -hmm. so the brain isn't exactly working well uh not that it does normally but uh (laughs) no i mean like a lot of it is you know you read it into a input boolean or into a you know whatever like some kind of a sensor in that sense right where where really i don't need to have an entity for that yes that yep. should just kind of exist uh with without me having to take the and and m- maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong but in my head having an entity takes more resources because it needs to store the state of it and you know wh- whatever that is right there's there's a bunch of stuff that needs to get that needs to happen in the back end rather than it just sitting in memory Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I would rather not have to build entities where I don't have to. Right. And uh, yeah. I don't know if it works that way. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'll have to read into it, but anyways, um, <laughs> what else is there? So if you have a sure pet care pet flap, so that's your little flap to for mm-hmm. your dog or cat to go in and out. Uh, you can now add a service to lock and unlock that pet flap. So there you go. Make sure your dog doesn't run away when you don't Liam want from it the to. the last episode will have to upgrade his cat flap. That's now, right. It won't just track which cats are coming in and out of the house. It'll be able to lock the cats out. That's right. Or, That's right. or lock the cats inside when the mower's on, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is instead of locking the mower out, lock the cat out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there is the now, there's a new concept for called significant changes, which is going to apply for the recorder component, Google Home and Amazon Echo. So right now, whenever a entity or a sensor updates its status, for example, if you've got a temperature sensor, you know, you might have a room that's 25.1 degrees and it changes to 25.2. That change will be sent to your recorder component, the Google Home and the Amazon Echo. So that's right. you know, very like small changes, right? Like, do we really care that the temperature has gone up by 0.1 of a degree? So from this release, uh, Home Assistant now will be tracking what are called significant changes. So let's say your temperature goes from 25.1 to now 27. That is a significant enough change that Home Assistant will then record that in the recorder, send it over to Google Home, and send it over to Amazon Echo. Every time, so any before this, every change would, you know, take up resources. You know, Home Assistant would have to call these services to do a fraction of a percentage change yeah. and it would also add a line in your database you know which consume space in your resources make your logbook slower to run so now with these significant changes uh hopefully that traffic will reduce and things should just be a bit more snappier under the hood interesting okay that's kind of cool i mean did they did they did they specify somewhere where what a significant change is like you, you use point one as an example but mm. is like is is that the limit? So if it's point two, does it show up in the in the logbook or and whatever Amazon Echo or 
anywhere else. To be honest, I I've I haven't taken a deep enough dive look into it. Um, I know it's done in a few places. For example, like Google Home, Amazon Echo, and the recorder yeah. are handling it. I haven't seen how they're defining that significant change, though. So I don't know what the thresholds are, or if they're even customizable. Um, so hopefully, gotcha. when it gets close to release, uh, we can find out a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully, I mean, it'd be pretty cool if it is customizable. Because then, you know, what if somebody is graphing every little yeah. part of it, and they do, like, mm. they're not concerned about resource usage, and they just care that they care more about the data than than the resource usage. Then, you know, that might that might be kind of interesting, right? So, mm, that's a good point. Um, yeah, there are now new services added to input select element. So you can now choose to cycle through the input select or select the first and select the last. So if you're using services or any kind of automations there, you can actually get it to, to cycle through uh, whatever you're trying to do. So there you go. Or actually, pick the yeah. first option, pick the last option. Very cool. If you've got like a input select that's you know, got like sequential options that you want to run through and now you don't have to work out all right am i on this one then i need to go to this one am i on this one all right now yeah, my next one is yeah. so you can just go cycle dot next and it'll go go down that traverse the list in order so that'll be very powerful or or i mean even even if you're even if you're if you have some kind of you know whether it's a playlist for music or even if you want to call it a playlist for like yeah lighting scenes or something like that you can kind of go through whatever that's a good point actually yeah and and see how that works right so Again, it's it's uh, you can it's it's almost like creating a demo mode, right? Like you know how if you go to a, yeah. go to a like an appliance store or whatever electronic store, and you go you see a TV there that's just cycling through some demo videos or whatever. <laughs> you can basically do that now. You just give me another idea for my tags. Now I can I've got a tag on my desk here, um, and so when I tap it and my computer's on, it yeah. wants to play music, right? Well, now I can use this to have like a, a drop down of spotify playlists and so each time i tap my phone it will just cycle through the playlist yeah yeah you can totally do that i, I at first i thought you were talking about wanting to set up a electronic store in your, in your house i was like Wait, oh what? yeah oh that's <laughs> totally right that's funny <laughs> uh all right um there's also new services so you can now move foscam pan tilt and zoom cameras to a preset so i think we mm. had uh someone recently on the, the podcast they have their cameras turned away when people are home. So you could have a preset so that when everyone gets home, the preset turns on and the cameras will turn away from everyone to that preset. So cool. yeah, that's really cool. Uh, Logitech Harmony Hub now has switches for different activities. So um, yeah, a little more enhancement I, there, I guess. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about that one. I, I know that as soon as I restart, I'm going to get a whole bunch of Amazon Echo components saying, hey, you're watch Netflix activity or your watch Netflix switch is now available by Nabucasa. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, well, maybe get ahead of it and mm, turn it off, it. Uh, disable yeah. it from the uh, configuration. Right. So if you go to config yeah. home assistant cloud in there, you can actually change what you, uh, what, what entities you, get pushed, what across. you, what you sing to yeah. exactly what you sing to uh, Amazon echo and Google assistant. So, That's um, interesting. Yeah. All right, some breaking changes. Uh, so the following components have all been moved, or sorry, have all been fully transitioned to the configuration via the user interface. So if you're using the August, Roomba, Doorbird, Logitech Harmony Hub, Network UPS Tools, MyQ, Nexus, Hunter Douglas PowerView, Ratio, Tesla Powerwall, New Heat, they have all fully transitioned, so you don't need to have them in your YAML files anymore. You can just go ahead and remove them from YAML. They're all done via the UI. Well, it sounds like you have to remove them, right? So Yes, yeah. Um, so you basically, they, they've already been imported from in the past, mm. and uh, you can just get rid of it now. Cause uh, that unless you're doing a, a huge like version bump, you should already have those. E- Yes. Yes. UI. Exactly. And and you know, and if you use MyQ, it probably doesn't work anyway. So sorry, little <laughs> li- little little passive aggressiveness there. So good for the good day. Um, um, but interesting to see you have like a big push to the UI. So I think we'll, I think that's going to be a theme for at least most of this year. I think just integrations slowly moving across to the UI. Yeah, which is which is great. I mean, I it's it's funny because when I was actually setting up a couple of these, and I was like, this is again a while ago. 
I was, you know, like first I check at the UI, then I check, then it's like, okay, I don't see it. Then I'll go in yeah. and, and double check that. Hopefully the documentation has also been updated for those as well, for those components that say, hey, you know, go into the UI mm. and add it this way. Um, so um, support for Python 3.7 has been dropped. Um, so the the support was officially deprecated as of uh, one, 0.116. Uh, but now it has been fully, fully dropped. So if something doesn't work, you know, first thing people are going to say is upgrade to 3.8 or whatever uh, past there. If mm. you do use um, Docker or I guess the supervised home assistant as well, you don't need to really worry about that because that'll, that'll just get upgraded in the, through the Docker container. Yeah. Yeah. That's all handled for you. Yeah. But if you run it in a virtual environment, then, then you do have to worry about it. Mm. Uh, and Rahan, this is what we were talking about before with Z-Wave. So the old Z-Wave integration is now considered legacy and deprecated. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying, the integration is still based on Open Z-Wave 1.4, which has been out of active maintenance for quite some time. So they're not maintaining it anymore. And I think, you know, with this push now to Z-Wave JS, they're just, that's it. You know, if you're still using it, start migrating over. I think one important thing is if you've got a Z-Wave USB stick, uh, the pairing of devices is actually done on the USB stick itself. So right. you can take that stick out and plug it into a Z-Wave JS server and in theory not have to go around your house and, and repair everything. It should just work. Yeah, and keyword there is in theory. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out when you move over, somehow it wipes the stick or something. Like that. Uh, but uh, but just, again, as usual, just regular cautions apply, right? Just make sure you are ready to do that. Don't do it on a, a day where you're having a, a party or something and you need every automation to be working smoothly. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you're here and you have a party, you will get ticketed quite a bit. So <laughs> you probably shouldn't do that anyways, depending on where you are. Exactly. The Plex.play on Sonos service has been removed and now it's actually just straight up migrated into the media player dot play media service so if you do use some kind of play on uh or if you use plex and you leverage plex to play something on your sonos you and and if that's especially if it's part of some automation or something like that that will not work anymore and yeah just migrate again the same payloads can uh can be used you just need to uh if there, there there's a file called uh, not a file there's a, there's a value you set called media content ID. You just need to preface that with plex colon slash slash and that should work. That actually becomes a lot cleaner than... Yeah, it's oh. and, and it's less services to make it more confusing, yeah. right? It's, right. you know, oh, I'm trying to play this media. Okay, maybe it's the play media service, not the play on Sonos service, right? Which is just kind of like, I, I get why that was the case, but, uh, you know, it just makes more sense this way. I have a feeling that my home, this is an instance, and maybe I just get confused, but I think I have a, a, a media player dot play underscore media and a media player dot media underscore play service. Yeah. And that like just confuses me all the time. Like which one do I use? I can't remember what integration the other one has come from. Um, but yeah, it's all these services that, you know, are custom to each component I I hope they slowly get phased out, right? Because, it, yeah, it just becomes a headache trying to find which service you actually have to call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at mine right now, and I have both as well, media player underscore media play, media player underscore play media. So Okay, good. I didn't make it up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's a thing. So, yeah, hopefully, again, even hopefully a lot of those kind of things can get uh, – squashed and kind of kind of brought into a single uh single service where again as 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 a user it needs to be a little more intuitive right from that perspective so all right another breaking change the speed of the dyson pure cool link fan is now one of low medium and high instead of the original auto or a number between one to ten so now i have one of these fans and i'm a bit uh, I'm not sure about this change. I guess I'll, I'll I'll have to live with it. But in order to set the fan speed more precisely, so they have you know that one to ten, um, or to switch to auto mode, you should use one of the services Dyson Set Speed and Dyson Set Auto Mode. See these things like why is there a Dyson Set Speed? Like couldn't there be like a fan set speed? Yeah. Or a, a fan like set mode like or it's fan dot set option service. Because I've got like my Xiaomi fan that has like natural breeze, you know, I've got like 
um, oscillating, you know, like there's a whole bunch of options that could, you know, just be standardized into yeah. one service. That, that, it, <laughs> it's funny that they name it like natural breeze and whatever. It sounds like some <laughs> kind of uh some kind of like a scented oil or something. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but no, I, I, I agree. But d- this, uh, this, uh, I thought the Dyson fans use one to 10 on the fan itself or am, or am I mistaken? Yeah. No, they do. Definitely. Okay, so then there's there's definitely some kind of discrepancy between what the device itself has versus what's what Home Assistant yeah. is. So I'm guessing they're trying to standardize. Like I'm guessing fans in general have low, medium, high. Got it. But um, I, I'm guessing they're going to map like a low to one, medium to five, and a high to ten. Mm-hmm. You know, I can test it. It might be a guess. Uh, yeah, it is what it is. I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh Rain machine services now need an entity ID, an area ID, or a device ID parameter to be provided. So if you use rain machine, make sure you're actually looking at uh, at your automation. If you had it before, great, but now it's mandatory. Uh, Now, Ron, before we um, wrap up today, I wanted to just have a little uh, shout out, something that you shared with me yesterday, which is, and we talked about it before in the security bulletin, but it's Dwayne's Lovelace dashboard. Mm -hmm. Um. This thing looks awesome. Now, I've been using SoftUI from uh, Nathan, who was on uh, one of our uh, episodes last year. And it's always, uh, and this is the thing, right? The home is there's so many ways to skin a cat. But this Lovelace dashboard, it's like a full system. You know, you you run it, you can, yeah. um, it looks really professional. Uh, are you gonna? What are your thoughts on it? Are you gonna move over to it? Are you gonna look at it? I'm gonna look at it again. I don't. I don't know how much it's going to involve. Like how much work it's going to involve. They say yeah. uh, the the post actually said it's pretty, pretty quick. Um, it just to to me it looked like a very polished uh, version, right? And I, I really, really, really like Nathan's uh, soft UI. But uh, the only the only thing I think I think Dwayne's Lovelace dashboard that the big difference here is the way it presents the information is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, where it's it, it, it it's closer to like one of the like a store bought kind of like a smart things or something like that, yeah. right? Where you know you you see you see a lot of that information and you see a lot of it presented in a specific way. And I don't know, I I just really liked liked uh, how it was laid out. So. I mean, check it out. Yeah, we'll leave links in the uh, description. But yeah, I'm definitely looking at it. I, I really like the way it uses, it leverages, you know, home misses and groups. It has, you know, its own configuration files. And it looks like, yeah, pretty basic to set up. And it's a full system and, and it's powered by Lovelace, right? So I think there's a lot of pros and yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be. It should be pretty good. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this month's release it's good to see that the re- releases are getting slightly larger now yeah 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 exactly well i mean it, it is it is every month right so there's there's mm. an extra week to look at it it's, and and part of the qa process too right it's a little longer for it to qa and things like that yeah so i'm i'm okay with that all right see you next month perfect <laughs> cheers all right cheers if you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.